Good morning and welcome back to Logisim Asia Pacific 2021. Uh, track number one, we have a panel discussion upcoming with Smart Cities, the Foundation for Industry 4.0. Um, we'll be led by Stephanie Krishnan. She is the, head, uh, the research director for uh, IDS, IDC Asia Pacific and responsible um, for this uh, segment. She will be introducing the teams um, in the next minute. Um, Stephanie, over to you. Great. Thank you, Marcus. Much appreciated. And here we are today on the topic of uh, Smart Cities, a foundation for Industry 4.0. Today I have with me um, three guests. We have uh, Scott Copeland, who's the VP of Logistics Transformation at Schneider Electric, Peter Woon, who is the Director of Supply Chain Management, CNW Services, and Kendrick Ng, who's the Director of Logistics and Supply Chain. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you here today. And thank you to everybody who's attending today. Um, looking forward to some great discussion and great questions and, and sharing from the audience. Um, just to, to give you an idea of the sort of flow that we'll be going through, we, we do have a plan to, to look at some of the definitional aspects of this and some of the underpinning ideas. Um, we'll have a, a chat about the technology, but we'll also bring in sustainability um, as well as its impact on um, overall impact on the supply chain. So. Um, when we're talking about uh, smart cities and industry 4.0, um, you know, according to the United Nations, you know, as, as we put in our, our topic uh, uh, excerpt, according to the United Nations Population Division, in 2020, 56% of the world population lives in cities. So, you know, having cities and, and thinking about urban logistics and urban supply chains is certainly something that we need to address these days. Um, Industry 4.0 is a strategy of operational transformation that brings together technology, process and people or the organization and it has a data as a foundation to deliver extreme efficiency, quality and performance with considerations of implications for people and the planet. Now when we're looking at smart cities we're looking at slightly different goals. We're looking at economic development, sustainability, um, citizen requirements. Uh, the need to um, engage those citizens and build an ecosystem of partners to fundamentally change and improve, and improve the quality of life for citizens. So these seem to be quite disparate things, but smart cities are actually uh, a foundation on which we operate as, as logistics companies. So I'd like to take this into the discussion um, with perhaps, you know, Scott to start, um, you know, in terms of what we mean about talking about smart cities and industry 4.0. I've come at it from a, a definitional point of view, which we have it here at IDC. Um, perhaps you have something to add here. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, Stephanie, I think it's really about how we bring together um, our tangible physical environment around us, um, together with all those massive flows of data that we're experiencing and we're capturing today, uh, particularly since the popularity and the launch, really, um, of the industrial cloud, and then how we use the opportunity for AI to unlock that uh, and better enable our fast moving lifestyles. Uh, I think we're all feeling that, uh, particularly in the last 18 months. Uh, you know, we're all living in this uh, kind of work from home environment that was envisaged as something of the future, but it's definitely right here, right now. Um, and that AI has really given us lots of uh, analytics uh, to help us understand the shifting customer buying behaviors. Uh, we're using transportation data to optimize model selection and minimize our carbon footprint. Um, you know, really understanding our power usage and our power requirements as more and more people move to these smart cities and how we make sure that we enable them with the infrastructure required as we overlay that grid of Industry 4.0 technology on, on top of the landscape in which we live today. So, yes, yeah, certainly. That's, that's, go ahead. Yeah, certainly the, the, what I'm hearing is the, you know, knowing about our customers and where they're at, you know, the transportation and the informational requirements and as well as the energy aspects are certainly things that we can definitely, um, you know, utilize and, and optimize for our industry 4.0 capabilities that we build into, you know, and when we talk about industry 4.0, we're not just talking about manufacturing, yeah, we're talking about, you know, warehouses, um, with the industrialization of, of, you know, retail operations and things like that. So certainly a lot of implications there. Um, yep. Peter, perhaps you could talk a little bit more with, you know, just thinking about the relevance of smart cities to manufacturers and their supply chains. Um, you know, you're coming at this from a smart buildings perspective. Perhaps you could give some insight on how you think, you know, that contributes to the, the effectiveness of Industry 4.0 capabilities for supply chain professionals. Sure. 
Well, you know, when you talk about smart cities, you, also, you know, you don't look at it from just a city perspective. You also have to look at it from a people, process, technology, and infrastructure perspective. All right. So when you look at then when you zoom in on infrastructure, then you know part of smart cities is smart. It's also buildings. You have buildings, and you, and you have uh, buildings of different nature and different purposes and use of purpose. So in in the sense of when we look at it overall, uh, when we we try to relate it back to the log uh, to the supply chain and logistic industry. The buildings that we are going to occupy in and operate in will also need to be part of this ecosystem of smart cities, you know. And then we have, uh, you know, things like, for example, in logistics and supply chain, you have your your actual physical offices, you have your uh, logistics centers, you have your dis dis distribution centers, you have your warehouses, uh, you have your fulfillment centers, as well as your right now most recently a, a, a recent phase a data warehouse <laughs> you know not only talking about physical warehouse but also data warehouse so when you when you have this need for this to be housed in a particular uh, infrastructure a building then you, you you then relate back to smart cities also down to the next level down as smart buildings and part of smart buildings also uh, will relate into uh, where you need to look into smart buildings and how do you manage a smart building through smart fm so i have here a slide and this is something that I borrowed from uh, the BCA, actually, a uh, guide to Smart FM. So, you know, if you look at the slide there here, it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting slide where you talk about five-step kind of a Smart FM process. So, in the five-step, which I thought was a good, interesting, very simple model that you need to look at when you start looking at, at how do you want to manage a building uh, in a smart uh, building basis and what are the things you need to look out for. So, there are five steps here, including the first step, which is the most important step, is try to aligning your business objectives. All right, so you look at business objectives and you align that followed by step two, three, four, and five. I'm not going to go through every step, but I thought this is a good slide to share with everyone. I'm just going to focus on step one, setting up the business objectives. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and elaborate that a little bit better. So, if Steph, can you move down the next slide, please? Okay, when aligning the business objectives, here is where many people and many companies fail to uh, to to look at it in full details to get the full effectiveness at harnessing the the area of smart. That is to say, they they implement a smart building, smart te technology, and then not aligning it to their business objectives. So, in the area of smart building and smart FM, we have three pillars here that was listed out, listed down as a guideline. So, you have for the purpose of efficiency. So, you know, when you do a smart initiative, what, why are you doing it for? Is it because you want to improve efficiency, improve productivity? Then you then you align that in the area, which is a good way to do it. The other way is to delight your occupiers, which is your your tenants, your, your customers. Okay. And last but not least is to look at that, uh, enhancing your uh, actual building asset itself. So when you have all the, you, you can align your objectives accordingly and think through it, then your, your so-called your ROI of, of invest, investing into this technology makes sense. Many a times we see a simple case where management say, okay, everybody's going smart. I need to do something about smart uh, initiative as well. Let's uh, have a command center. Let's digitalize. Let's put LED panels and dashboard all over the place, you know, and then we look smart. Okay, but without understanding, just displaying the dashboard, displaying all that, without actually understanding what are you trying to achieve, you may not get the ROI at the end of the day. What you get is a, a, a series of nice display assets, but then you got no uh, no next next course action to to improve or to 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 address your objectives overall. And that's why I thought this chart here shows quite an interesting way uh, on the pillar side. And then for the foundation, you see then the digitalization and a few others at the foundation level below, which enhance the overall. Uh, Kind of picture so i thought this was quite a one picture tells all kind of situation to address that uh per se all right thanks Jessica. yeah thanks very much so um you know we've talked about that from a building perspective and i guess in in drilling down into the foundations and how that attaches to smart cities um you know scott perhaps you mentioned energy be before perhaps we could talk a little bit about you know how we would then optimize the energy usage and and how that relates to the city infrastructure yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're in a pretty privileged position in China, and that's something that we, we sell every day to our customers. Uh, we provide services, equipment, and software uh, to better monitor um, the quality and the supply um, of energy to our customers. Um, I think we all, or maybe some of us, but definitely Ojin Schneider felt the pinch um, and are still feeling the pain from some of the plastic shortages uh, when we had the, the power outages in Texas due to the weather earlier this year. Uh, so really, you know, it's really uh, imperative as we move forward as the world becomes more demanding that we establish really sustainable links uh, in terms of our, our quality and supply 
um, of power is it's definitely becoming a bigger requirement, especially with these dynamic environments. So by utilizing equipment that has IoT enabled uh, smart foundations, we're able to then take that data back from our customers, really understand their requirements, uh, and really then be able to ensure that where we're uh, making investments in grid, uh, where governments are making investments in grid, it's really supporting uh, the requirements of those uh, local cities and towns. Yeah, and that has the win-win. I mean, you have uh, better energy efficiency, which is obviously decreasing costs. You have the, the ability that energy availability is therefore increased because there's a greater pool for, for the, the community as a whole to, to draw from. Um, Absolutely. So that I mean, yeah, it even links into, you know, being able to then forecast better upstream in your own business to understand, uh, you know, the customer buying behaviors and patterns before they happen. So it makes it a lot more predictive in the way that you uh, build your strategy going forward. Yeah. And and then, you know, with that, with, you mentioned IoT and then Peter has talked about smart buildings, which obviously brings us to, you know, we need to connect all this together. Um, you know, Kendrick, I know that, you know, you and I have talked about connectivity, perhaps. Perhaps you can, look, uh, you know, introduce us to the idea of connectivity and the role it plays in this. Yeah. So we, we know that smart cities rely heavily on high bandwidth connectivity, right? So na naturally, we always think of 5G deployment. Uh, to take us into creating smarter cities. And they are, they are like a parallel trajectory that we, we, we they, they both need each other to, 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 to expand, right? So do you know that 5G to be fully deployed, every square mile requires like eight uh, miles of fire optics. So we, in today in Singapore, we, we know that yes, it's a uh, fire, uh, fiber, um, concentrated already um, but we are in smart cities we are not just talking about Singapore right? we, we are looking at Manila Hanoi Bangkok these cities do not have good fire uh, fiber optics uh, network uh, today uh, and and even for Singapore we are not even uh, looking at density right we need it to be more dense uh, than than what we have to to have 5g fully deployed so what is the challenge uh, with fiber optics? It's really the deployment, right? We, we need permits to start digging the ground. We need uh, to protect the cables. All these are really high barriers of entry. And uh, each mile probably costs like mm, 100,000 uh, just to put the fiber optics in the ground. So I actually have the privilege to mentor a Singapore startup. Uh, it's called Trans Celestial. Uh, they are funded by EDB Investments. And what they do, it's really using laser technology point to point to bring high bandwidth, low latency, and being small, like a shoebox, 3 kg, they can be rapidly deployed to many cities and, and, and easily um, like roads and, and, and so on. So to complement the fiber optics, say in Singapore, this laser point to point helps in increasing that density that I was uh, referring to. And, and density in terms of putting on the street furniture, things like uh, lampposts, things like shelters and uh, buildings, right? So deployment now has dropped to say a fraction of what the cost of fiber is. So I, I will actually share a, a video link with SK Telecom and Trans Celestial, um, where they bring high bandwidth and low latency to the library in Goyang, South Korea. So, so my, my thought, of course, I mean, with connectivity, what does that really mean to companies out there, right? With the faster deployment, bringing down the cost, lowering down the barriers, we are talking about faster adoption. So what you see in um, two years down the road, uh, maybe fast steam to say just next month, next quarter, right? And, and what I encourage uh, all, the, uh, all the listeners out there is really whether you're manufacturing, your warehouse operators, your logistics, start thinking of sort of how to plug into the smart city sort of initiatives now. Yeah, so that's, that's my view. So, so looking at, you know, not just traditional forms of connectivity as well, but looking at alternate forms of connectivity, especially where a lot of logistics and, and manufacturing organizations are operating, which is not necessarily close to, to the city, but allows for connectivity to the city as well, which is, is certainly something I think that provides value. 
Exactly. Yeah. Now, now keeping those technologies in mind, um, you know, a smart city does use data and communication technologies to improve the quality of government services, but um, is dependent on that connectivity, IoT and video sources. Um, we look at those for enabling things such as building automation and public safety. So um, in terms of the, the different technologies, you know, we, we, we hear of AI, we hear, you know, we need to have that data foundation. Um, you know, IoT is obviously a clear one. So how can these technologies be used by these manufacturers to support these modern supply chains? Right? You, we've talked about some of the individual elements, but now how are we actually going to use them? Um, Scott, perhaps you could begin. Yeah, sure. I mean, so um, today, well, we spoke already about how it helps with forecasting and understanding customer requirements. But if we get into our actual operations and, and we look at today uh, how we're using machine learning, smart cameras and other applications. Um, if we went to a, a surface mount technology production line today uh, in a plant, we can see uh, smart cameras analyzing uh, very complex printed circuit boards way faster than a, a human could and to a, to a higher degree of uh, of accuracy and then taking that through machine learning algorithms um, through sensors that are enabling the team to even understand environmental aspects around it and everything else self-optimizing all the time so we've got floor solder machines altering the temperature by point one of a degree um, to maximize their quality and all the time learning uh, how to be better at that um, in real time then inside of our uh, distribution centers uh, we also see IoT applications that are taking sensor data uh, into a layer uh, of apps that is then looking at things like predictive maintenance, uh, picking up on vibrations from motors uh, in automation, picking up on route optimization for AGVs uh, and autonomous mobile robot, and all the time optimizing uh, against the execution data that's coming in to understand when's the optimal time. Uh, to make those uh, changes in the machinery with a minimum of downtime, minimum of impact, uh, and minimum of customer impact, of course, in Brazil. Yeah, the, that, it's interesting you, you, you mentioned that route optimization angle as well, because I think from a smart cities perspective, we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of data being pushed, pushed onto, you know, to publicly available sites yeah. um, and a lot of a lot of enablement that's being done to, to say, you know, we've got uh, blockages at, at certain border crossings or we've got um, blockages at uh, or, or congestion at certain parts, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for that to that that public-private barrier um, to utilise the data. That's available. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Kendrick, you mentioned uh, connectivity previously and elucidated mm -hmm. on that. Um, you know, you've mentioned that smart city. Uh, we know that smart city initiatives are data hungry, and this drives the need for that high-speed um, internet with low latency. Um, you know, in terms of you know, you've mentioned this this laser um, connectivity that, that can happen and, and another alternative such as 5G is and um, 5G and uh, fiber optic. So how are organizations using that to connect? So so we, we, we look to technology to really help us to enable our productivity, right? What how to make things faster, cheaper and better. So um, with automation and robotics uh, and Together with this connectivity that I mentioned, right, with the laser technology or even the, uh, the fiber optics, we see the increase in, in looking into cloud robotics and teleoperations. So let's talk about cloud robotics. It's, it's really an integrated platform of uh, robots. It could be AMRs on the ground, um, it could be goods to men. Um, it could be collaborative robot using a visual AI to, to pick and pack and, and eventually palletize. So, so if we have more of these, it will be more efficient, right? And, and, and connectivity typically drives uh, such uh, uh, enablement, right? And, and we talk about teleoperations. Teleoperations today is very limited to just fixed landline. Um, but with the faster deployment of 5G, we are looking at, say, today in Singapore, a, a, a lockdown. We could be seeing a crane operator at home, maybe operating excavator or lifting a container, right? So, and, and, and when, when things get better, it's not just one, op, one worker to one remote machine, but even a crew chief in charge of not just 
two, but maybe five or ten autonomously, uh, looking after a few uh, robots at once, right? So, so this connectivity just helps uh, spearhead such things. And, and we, we also see a lot of robotics uh, um, trend that's going towards the AR uh, and the virtual re reality, uh, embedding itself into automation. And, and that also needs that, that high bandwidth, low latency that I was mentioning. So, so for some examples, right, we, we, we have um, where, where these pri well, I call it private 5G that we implement for, say, uh, enterprises could be port operators. They could be bringing drones to, say, uh, offshore, right, or petrochemical plants. Um, so we, we are talking about in, in that whole environment, um, uh, drones operating together with teleoperations, looking at uh, VR, AR, are all together. Um, and that's, that's powerful, right? So, so, so we, we, we encourage actually all companies to not just think of the simple, you know, uh, little increments, but focusing on the better technologies that we can embrace through smarter cities. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned there the, 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 the teleoperations and I, you know, I know a lot of organizations are struggling with, you know, not having talent in country with border closures that we have. Um, or not being able to find the talent that they need with some of the, the shortages yes. in some, some markets and, and, you know, having the connectivity that's going to support these sort of operations and the streaming that's required, um, as well as, you know, the, the data going back and forth, I think is going to be certainly key. So um, that's certainly uh, one area. Now, um, uh, we do have one question. I'll get to that in a moment. I just um, wanted to talk about the infrastructure. Um, so looking at the infrastructure provided in smart cities supporting that, um, you know, Scott, you and I have talked about, um, you know, we, we, we've, we've talked here and we've talked before about IoT and, and how organizations can actually use that. Do you want to, to talk a little bit more on that? <clears throat> sure. Uh, so if we look at uh, what we're doing perhaps in Schneider today, so we have a, uh, a suite of products that we call EcoStructure and we've deployed that uh, in many of our plants uh, and our larger DC operations today. Uh, and what EcoStructure allows us to do really is first of all to, to gather data at a very scope one kind of uh, level to understand what's happening from an activity perspective within the building. Uh, but then obviously using edge control and a suite of apps and analytics, we're able to then expand uh, upon what is happening and understand every nuance of the operation. And the value really comes when you're able to lay this kind of data over your execution data. So if you're in a a warehouse, uh, your WMS data, uh, as in this example we see here, which is our Shanghai DC. Uh, you know, if you're in a manufacturing plant, then your manufacturing execution system, being able to take that data and overlay it with this, you can really then start to say, okay, if there's a change in my order profile, for example, my customer's working behavior, what does that mean to my energy requirements? What does that mean to my resource requirements? How do I see the impact correlating to those changes? And then can I take that data and use that in my own order orchestration uh, to really predict and sense and, and get ahead of the game, uh, and make sure that I understand very specifically uh, what level of impact is, is caused by what level of activity. And once you start to do that, the ability to just make much faster, uh, meaningful decisions in your, in your uh, operations is just tenfold what it was in the past, to be honest. You know, it's, as I said, it starts at a very base level, uh, really understanding uh, the, the level of activity and quality that's going on. And as you add incrementally uh, those levels of edge control and those apps and analytical services, you really do start to unlock it, but not really until, again, you can correlate that uh, with your execution data as well. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, one of the points that I picked up at the end there, which which I think is actually key as you add that incrementally, because I think there is an expectation that when we do go into digital transformation and utilising the capabilities that are available out there, um, there's there's an expectation that it's a zero to 100. Um, you know, yeah, there's, there's a very, very steep learning curve as well for people. I mean, we've got to remember, you know, it's not putting people out of a job has been the theme in many conversations. It's really about enabling these augmented operators to be better at what they're doing. 
Um, and obviously that takes some learning and some, some time to accept the new technology as well and work in different ways. I mean, you know, if you'd have told me uh, 20 years ago that, you know, some of our leading strategists in, in logistics um, would be people that have studied data science, uh, you know, I would have thought you were, you were crazy. But I mean, the, the profile of people that are operating, uh, you know, in our big operations today and making massive difference, completely different um, yeah. to what it was 20 years ago. And I, I, you know, the the type of people it takes time for those skills to, to develop, or for the people to be put in place that are going to be able to, to take advantage of that, um, which comes back to that industry four foundation. It's not just about the technology; it's about putting the people and the processes in place that are going to enable that. And I think that's Absolutely. that's you know quite important to um, talk about. Um, one of the other things that you know when we're looking at that sort of infrastructure, and, and I'm going to relate it back to one of the questions here. Um, how are last mile logistics players using industry 4.0 concepts and digital technologies and and i'll link that back to to you know a point i made earlier about you know some of the routing capabilities um the the, the amount of data that's coming down um you know from uh the cities themselves is actually quite key um and and bringing those industry 4.0 concepts and digital technologies you know we're seeing a lot more telematics around um you know organizations actually embedding connectivity in and iot into vehicles to be able to, to you know read data from what is happening um i've even worked with startups myself or, or sorry been exposed to startups myself that have uh, uh even doing that down to scooter level for deliveries in in cities so um you know when we're talking about that last mile it's everything from you know scooter to to you know b double or semi trailer um so it's it's you know we are seeing that level of telematics come in there um, then bringing that back into systems and linking the, that kind of operational technology to the IT. So um, down to the tra order transactions and, and bringing it into the warehouse, um, being able to have those warehouse management systems actually optimise based on uh, technology that's available from the city or from other providers um, that do provide open source data. Um, you know, even even you know feeds such as Google Maps are being used to, to you know, data from there being used to optimise uh, routes. So we're seeing a number of different uh, uh, optimization technologies using the data from cities to be able to, to optimize their last mile. But that obviously is requiring, you know, the, the IoT on the truck. You need to have the connectivity that's required. And, and in some cases, um, you know, we were talking to a, a Australian uh, trucking company and they said that they could have as many as, you know, five SIM cards on a, a lorry and they're, they're working on bringing that down. But, but getting that down to a single point of connection, I think, is important. Um, being able to, to bring all those data points in um, and being able to optimize for, you know, driver fatigue, the asset, yeah. making sure that that's performing well, uh, as well as making sure that the routes are, are optimized. So just to, to answer the question from Pankaj um, from IBM, thank you very much for that question. Um, and that, you know, is how some of the, the last mile capabilities are being used across um, yeah, from the tech, uh, last mile technologies are being used in, in that particular arena. Do anybody have anything to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I can add, you know, obviously from, a, as you say, from a network modeling perspective uh, on that one, Stephanie, you know, taking the initially, actually, maybe this addresses also the other question on how raw material suppliers uh, could benefit from this as well, is, you know, understanding your customer's buying behavior, first of all, um, and specifically by customer segmentation, what their buying behavior could be. Taking that data and using that in your network modeling, so understanding then where your volume requirements are, um, you know, and possibly, if possible, uh, modeling at a, a multi echelon inventory optimization level, which today is even more important given the huge shortages that we have in electronics, uh, the impact we had on plastics. Yeah. You know, I think really the other part of that, and tying back to that question, is. Uh, using CO2 as a currency in your network modeling approach as well. So make sure that, you know, it's, it's a defining factor in your scenario model uh, to understand your impact on CO2 um, as you change either your footprint uh, or the way that you service point A to point B in terms of transportation. Um, and then if you can bring that together in a kind of end-to-end -end control tower to really be able to sense and predict uh, impacts and also to adding live data feeds from incidents such as um, ships getting stuck in the sewers and everything else, um, you know, then that makes it much easier for you to respond 
uh, to issues, to be able to reroute inventory, to be able to sell inventory in transit, all kinds of things, you know. So it's really about starting off with that customer requirement, making sure that's connected to every decision you're making around your network optimization, and then enabling all of that data back into visibility layer so you're able to make decisions quickly and automatically. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, having ships stuck in, in waterways, but, you know, that, it's not limited to that. I mean, um, uh, you know, we know that some companies were able to, to book really quickly following the Tianjin explosion yep. there, right? And and yep. those that were able to do things like social listening, listening on social media and picking up on the sentiment that was happening there, were able to get first spots on planes and, and other ships out of there, right? So so that was quite key to yep. ensuring that those supply chains were, were running. Um, now, uh, moving on, I mean, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, you mentioned sustainability, Scott. Um, you know, when we are looking at the role of smart cities, it is to further the, you know, improve the lives of residents. And, and we're now, you know, being faced with the fact that, you know, the planet is potentially dying and around us and, and that we need to work on that in order to improve the, the life of residents. And obviously businesses have a role in this. Um, yep. Are you seeing this, you know, this sort of, uh, I guess, uh, tension happening between, you know, business and government and how is it affecting operations that you're seeing? Yeah, massively. I guess, to be honest, I mean, since everybody uh, started to embrace this, I would say more in the last year to 18 months, science-based targets are being announced for many, many companies, um, you know, and I think what the real awareness point is, is that no one company is ever going to be able to get there by themselves. Um, you know, we use, obviously, many partners in terms of supply. Uh, we use many partners uh, in terms of uh, distribution as well. Um, without us all collaborating as an ecosystem, there's no way we're going to be able to be successful uh, in delivering on all of our own respective values. You know, so, again, you know, how we come together, uh, how we use that way um, of pressure from shippers, uh, from carriers, um, and working with governments then to be able to influence investment in things like uh, EV charging infrastructure, so we're able to uh, electrify fleet. Um, you know, if you look at a country like Singapore, that's a fantastic opportunity where you've got a, you know, a hive of activity in, in a small geography. Um, you know, then really all of these key players can come together and make that happen. But if we try and do it alone, you know, we won't be successful. Yeah, and I think um, organizations or cities are trying to put together the infrastructure that um, allows for that co collaboration to happen from a data perspective, but also from a, a social infrastructure. So looking at opportunities to bring businesses together to make that happen. Now, Peter, you've talked about this in the context of, of buildings. <clears throat> and I think, you know, the, the impact of buildings, the potential for buildings to even be uh, uh, addressing sustainability issues for organisations is quite significant. Um, perhaps you could elucidate a little bit more on how you see, uh, you know, that contribution being made. Sure. I think uh, when you look at the building's perspective and the users of buildings, you have to look at uh, not only energy like what Scott has mentioned, but uh, also mm -hmm. other elements. So energy, of course, one of the key areas. We also look at energy, waste, and also the carbon emission uh, kind of criteria, not all trying to address the SDG goals here and there. But just take energy, for example, you look at energy, it's not just about energy savings, but you know, and the equipment that you have, which uh, you know, the squad presented a great model along there on the DSP kind of thing. So uh, that, that, that is a very great, good model to look at from overall energy perspective. But you also look at uh, energy efficiency over the, not only just the savings, but also the uh, in terms of the uh, renewable energies and use of renewable energies and other other factors. So those are the kind of areas that you want to see in order to overall. And uh, in terms of waste, you should look at recycling, re uh, reusing, implementing uh, circular kind of economy models where you not only re reuse, recycle, but re use the entire resource in its own its own entirety throughout the the, the whole cir the circular economy. And carbon, into how do you track and all that? So here's a chart that I wanted to share, and this primarily the chart I, I, I kind of like, it's a very nice uh, one picture tells all chart on the use of IoT devices. Uh, this chart was borrowed from a, from a slide deck from Bosch. So Bosch ha is one of, the, you know, one of the companies that has a lot of IoT devices here and there. When you look at the chart itself, you can see that there are many applications around the smart building perspective. Not, you know, not just looking at smart building in one, one, 
the silo dimension of within the building and you no know, within the building what can you implement within the building of lighting energy and so and equipment and so on but actually you can implement it quite uh, within the building and around the building and uh, around the infrastructure supporting the entire building so just taking from this picture i just did pick a few and try to relate back to sustainability so you can have a centralized operator dashboard a control tower similar to what uh, Scott has just uh, highlighted. And then you have all your IoT sensors implemented at all the respective point of usage or point of collection of data, ensuring that this collection is uh, then able to collect the data in the most efficient manner, addressing what Kendrick has mentioned about data uh, uh, latency and all that. So, uh, and here is where you have a new technology of not only having IoT bringing the data back to the server and or the cloud and making decisions, but also you have a new technology where we talk about uh, we talk about edge computing, the IoT sensors making the decisions and processing decisions at the point of usage. You know, we super simplify where you have edge computing, computing power and IoT sensors, which are, which are now the, the in thing coming into play. Then you move across from the right hand side clockwise over, you have light monitoring the, uh, you know, and, and control from energy efficiency. You have air. Air, uh, air quality, noise monitoring, uh, air quality of today is uh, even more important because of the COVID situation, as well as a uh, sick building and all the other stuff. You have the equipment monitoring uh, and space management in terms of your efficiency overall, Joe fencing, lift and uh, vertical uh, vertical equipment devices, car park, car park monitoring again for carbon emission and all the other stuff here and there, energy monitoring, pandemic proof workplace, and, and, and so on. So you, you relate all this back, you can collect data to support your sustainability goals and objectives that a company can have. And here's where you know a simple use of uh, IoT sensors itself uh, will help you to uh, get the data collection and the in, and getting the information that you need to make the decision. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think that brings up a good point because, you know, some of the, the uses that you mentioned there are not just about, you know, environment. And when we do talk about ESG goals, it is bringing in the social aspect there. So, you know, you are looking at the health and safety of the people inside the building. And I, and I think that's an important thing to address as, as part of this conversation. Um, all right, we're coming down to the last five minutes. So that should give us enough time to, for two minutes each. We've got six minutes. So, um, I'd just like to, to finalize with how each of the organizations, and if there are any other questions, please pop them in, I will say, um, but how organizations can seek to capitalize in the efforts of governments and cities to improve their um, infrastructure. So, you know, what can companies do and, and what are your thoughts on this? Just to wrap up. Uh, maybe I go first. Yep. Yeah, Scott, yeah, sure. Sure, uh, I mean, I guess, just back to my point before about uh, how we've got to collaborate together, you know, I just don't think it's something one company themselves can do, uh, no matter how, how huge or powerful that company is. So, you know, really, you know, take the time to kind of, uh, you know, leave your ego at the door and, and, and sit with your suppliers, sit with your, your partners, um, and work then with the government agencies to be able to uh, really unlock the potential here. Otherwise, uh, you know, let's, let's set up a single uh, company is going to be able to do that. I think really look at um, in your own business how you can use from a sustainability perspective, uh, carbon as a currency in your business cases. So, you know, we've all got set targets, which means we've all got offsets to, to meet as well uh, if we don't achieve carbon neutrality. So that's the cost that's coming. Uh, and as that cost comes in, then, you know, maybe we can use that predictive uh, viewpoint to be able to say, okay, let's offset that cost before it arrives. By making investments now in, in the technology that we need to, to get those going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Peter, perhaps any any last thoughts? Sure. Okay, I think uh, I like to emphasize the point of the the earlier slide deck that we showed on the on the corporate objectives, aligning the corporate objectives. You know, where you have the three areas of pillars on whether you are going for efficiency or you're going for uh, delighting your customer or you're going for asset enhancement here and there. If you're able to align the, the area, there'll be a, a good way to look into your corporate objectives and aligning it. Uh, in the foundation part, I also like to stress that digitalization is a nice word to have and, you know, and, and, and everybody seems to want to follow and put in a digitalization strategy. But digitalization is a big word actually. <laughs> and uh, many a times, many organizations fail to understand that the first thing you need at digitalization is also look at the people element which Scott highlighted. You know, it's not just about digitalizing technology. You also have to see the people, whether the, the people have the skill sets and the scalability to, to follow according to you know, what new digitalization program 
that you have in place. The people, the processes, as well as the technology, these are the key elements of digitalization. It's not just about technology, it's also the people and the process. And in the, in the, in the, in the technology portion, I also want to stress that Many a times, most organizations don't realize that the weakest point of their, uh, the, the strength of their supply chain or supply chain strategy is actually the, uh, the strength of, the, of their weakest link. So, for example, if your equipment and your technology is arcade technology, old technology, you need to look at upgrading that first. Uh, I had a situation where we ran in and looked at a particular property and their camera systems are still using analog. <laughs> okay, So, when you have an analog camera system that's 15 years old technology, and you try to have the latest data, video analytics, no way. You're going to spend so much more money just trying to try, try to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, fitting a round peg into a square, uh, fitting a square square peg into a round hole and, and likewise here and there. So you need to look at your technology, upgrading that to the level where you can, uh, can get efficiencies in order to move forward. And uh, upgrading technology includes also upgrading software and hardware and the people again to come to see whether they can handle that uh, and, and looking at interoperability as well. So these are the few elements that need to be careful of when you try to go into smart it's, it's, it's smart but it's very much smarter if you're not if you're not smart enough <laughs> thanks <laughs> great thanks thanks peter and and i think in that respect you answered just the last question that's come in from pankaj uh which was talking about you know where are adoption challenges with regards to iot and ai for cities and i think that evaluation of the technology you know legacy technology and the technology debt that companies have is quite key there um, I think for, you know, I was listening to a, a conversation yesterday where, you know, we were talking about water, um, you know, water usage and electricity companies and, and water companies that are managing this. And I think, you know, they talk about once in a generation investments when it comes to technology mm. upgrade dates. And I think, you know, the, that evaluation of, of, you know, technology and, and, you know, the need to upgrade it, I think that cycle is starting to, to shorten, but they're still talking about once in a generation technology adoption so so i think that's probably the biggest hurdle that that is coming through um kendrick perhaps um you could you could go with your wrap-up comments and then uh we'll pass it back to yeah. marcus after that yeah i mean I, I i really encourage all the companies out there to really think of all the enabling technologies that we discuss uh, not just in this panel but also logistics right um thinking of the end in mind uh and with with the greater connectivity that is being fast tracked in the deployment uh, through laser, uh, bringing the high bandwidth, bringing the low latency, um, I think companies can really reap the benefits. And 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 just now we we hear it's really about the human machine collaboration. Um, don't fear the machine. Uh, really um, enable it uh, and help human productivity at at the end of the way. Right. So. So it's not just hardware that we are talking about today. Uh, we, we are talking about robots, we are talking about um, AI, RPA, and helping the connectivity to, to scale up your operation. So I, I guess that the message is really start small, but start now, right? So mm -hmm. that to maximize the benefit, yeah. Yeah, I say start small and think big because I think that roadmap is going to be key. Um, making sure that you do put, you know, investments in place today that are going to allow you to scale to the capabilities that you want for tomorrow. Um, and being able to, you know, look around and see what, what capabilities are available through the cities that you're operating in. And, and I know organizations are, are actively looking at those capabilities in terms of their investment choices for, for setting up their supply chain networks and optimizing their capabilities in the region. So um, definitely something to think about there. Um, thank you very much to Scott, Peter and Kendrick for your time today. Um, we're at 12.01, so hopefully just in time and not intruding too much on anybody's lunch. Um, very much appreciate the conversation and thank you to everybody that's uh, attending and uh, I hope you found today quite fruitful. Thanks, thank you. Stephanie. Thank you very much. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Steph, uh, for the panel discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the audience for listening in and the interesting questions. Uh, thank you for joining Logisim Asia Pacific. We will continue after the lunch break at 1.30 with the next um, sessions. Uh, please have a look at uh, the schedules, what they interests you most. Please join us again. And thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Don't forget to join the virtual networking. And the virtual <laughs> networking. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye.